Okay, so good evening. I'm Kay Tortman and I am one of the organizers of this year's J. Owen Miller Symposium, which is the inaugural Yale Mental Health Symposium. Before our keynote address, which is hosted this evening on World Suicide Prevention Day, I'd like to take a few moments to welcome you all virtually to the Yale School of Architecture. Despite this challenging time, we are delighted to have moved this event online to what proves to be a groundbreakingly accessible conference format. And we are thrilled to have over 800 people registered for this event. This inaugural symposium is titled Beyond the Visible, Space, Place and Power in Mental Health. Our goal is to build collective capacity in improving access to mental health services and destigmatizing perceptions of mental health embedded in the built environment. Our organizers and speakers consider the relationship between mental health and the built environment to be an urgent conversation. Recent events have highlighted endemic inequities in relation to access to mental health care. The systematic violence inflicted on BIPOC communities brought to light during the global anti-racism protests sparked by the killing of George Floyd underscores the urgency to change the systems that inflict racial trauma. It is time to examine these systems of which many are intrinsically linked to the built world and have cascading effects on access to mental health, on perceptions of mental health, and on outcomes in mental health. This is the first event of its kind, building on the work of the Yale Mental Health Colloquium in 2019. Um, this symposium is really an interdisciplinary collaboration and will be traveling between schools at Yale in years to come, so watch the space. Um, this event will be hosted, um, will host discussions at three scales, the hospital, the home, and the city. And we really imagine and encourage this to be messy and disruptive and all conversations will be put um, on our website. And at any time throughout this session, you can post questions in the Q&A panel found at the bottom of your screen. And at the end of the lecture, we will call on audience members and unmute you and you'll be able to ask your question. I now want to thank the fantastic and charismatic symposium team, Mariana Riabom, Gus Dea, Jen Chin, Araceli Lopez and Jackson Lindsay from YSOA. We would also like to thank our advisors, Cheryl Holbrook from the Yale School of Management and Phil Corlett from the Yale Department of Psychiatry, who are both co-founders. Also our advisors, Joel Sanders, Elihu Rubin and Jessica Helfand. Um, Michael Rowe and members of our standing committee uh, and also folk here at YSOA, Phil Bernstein, Richard DeFumery, AJ and Dean Deborah Burke. We thank you for your continued and dedicated support. We have a compelling group of speakers who are doing inspiring work in this field. And we hope that through this sharing of knowledge, we can find a language or a system or a framework to begin to renegotiate typical or unquestioned relationships with mental health and the built world, which are at times beyond the visible. And with that, I'd like to pass things on to Dean Deborah Burke, who is going to introduce our fantastic keynote speaker, Mindy thompson Fulila. Thank you, Kate, and uh, enormous thanks to the team of alumni, students, faculty, and staff who have organized this year's J. Irwin Miller Symposium. Uh, since Kate just mentioned you all by name, I will not repeat that, but on behalf of the whole school, I really want to underscore our thanks to every one of you. What we're doing tonight is a first for the School of Architecture and that we have never done a symposium remotely before. The students, some of you now graduates, organizing the symposium, along with the faculty and staff, have worked hard to make this possible. Uh, I ask for your patience, should we have any technical difficulties, but we are really delighted that you all can join us from wherever you might be uh, for tonight's keynote lecture and for the other upcoming events of the symposium. And while I'm very sorry not to see you in person and welcome you to Rudolph Hall, the home of the Yale School of Architecture, it still gives me great pleasure to be with you in some way and to be able to introduce tonight's speaker, um, Mindy Thompson Fullalove. But before I introduce Professor Fullalove, two other brief introductions. First, Professor Elihu Rubin, who will be moderating tonight's discussion following the lecture. Elihu is an Associate Professor of Urbanism at the School of Architecture with a secondary appointment in the Department of American Studies. 
At Yale, LAHU has initiated a range of community-based student-driven research and representation projects, including the New Haven Building Archive, Excavating the Armory, and the New Haven Industrial Heritage Trails, among many others. He is also the Director of Undergraduate Studies for the Urban Studies major at Yale College. Elihu is the author of Ensuring the City, the Prudential Center and the Postwar Urban Landscape, published by Yale University Press in 2012. It received the Best Book Award from the Urban History Association, um, to his credit. He is also the co-founder of a documentary film company called American Beat and has produced films about social history and cultural landscapes in New Haven. He received his BA from Yale and an MA and PhD from the University of California at Berkeley. The second introduction is actually more of a thanks to the family of J. Irwin Miller. Mr. Miller was a graduate of Yale College in 1931 and later a trustee of both Yale University and the Ford Foundation. Best known to the community of architects, he is the man who started the Cummins Foundation, which supports the architecture of Columbus, Indiana. Mr. Miller's family gave a gift to the school in his honor to support events like this symposium, and we continue to be very grateful for their generosity. The symposium titled, as Kate said, Beyond the Visible, Space, Place, and Power in Mental Health, is the reason we are together tonight uh, for its keynote lecture to be given by Mindy Thompson Fullalove. Professor Fullalove graduated from Bryn Mawr with a BA in history, and she subsequently received a Master of Science in Nutrition and her Doctor of Medicine degree from Columbia's, Columbia University's College of Physicians and Surgeons. She's board certified in psychiatry. Professor Fullalove is a social psychiatrist and professor of urban policy and health at the New School in New York. Since 1986, she has conducted research on AIDS and other epidemics of poor communities with a special interest in the relationship between the collapse of communities and the decline in health. From her research, she has published numerous articles, book chapters, and monographs. She has also written The House of Joshua, Meditations on Family and Place, Root Shock, How Tearing Up City Neighborhoods Hurts America and What We Can Do About It, and Urban Alchemy, Restoring Joy to America's Sorted Out Cities. A third edition of Homeboy, Come to Orange, a story of people's power, which she helped her father, Ernest Thompson Wright, was released in May 2018 by New Village Press. She is co-author with Hannah L.F. Cooper of From Enforcers to Guardians, a public health primer on ending police violence, uh, published by Johns Hopkins University Press very timely in January of this year. She is also co-author of Roderick Wallace's Collective Consciousness and Its Discontents, Institutional Distributed Cognition, Racial Policy, and Public Health in the United States. Her forthcoming book is no longer forthcoming. It has just been released, I was delighted to learn tonight. Uh, it's called Main Street. Please order it from your local bookseller. She is the co-founder and board president of the University of Orange, a community organization and free people's urbanism school in Orange, New Jersey, which builds on collective capacity for people to create more equitable cities, which ties her efforts and ours at the School of Architecture very closely together. Please join me in welcoming Mindy Thompson, full of love. You can use that nice little clap signal on your screen. Welcome Mindy, and thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's very exciting. What a great conference. Um, I am a social psychiatrist, which means that I think about the social as the foundation of health. And it also means, in my case, that I think more about how does society create health as opposed to how do we manage disease. And so I thought I would just take you through some of what I think uh, which is very big picture and not so much focused on hospitals, homes, and cities, but even more big picture than that. And um, so that's what we're going to do tonight. Um, I was invited to speak to a preservation studio at Pratt. And the, the, the very, from the, the professor said that he thought I would be the best scholar uh, to talk about three things. Of course, I was very flattered that he thought I would be the best. 
Um, but the three things were social cohesion and resiliency, how to preserve communities when natural disasters hit, and what to do about commercial corridors, which is, is in a way how I came to shape this talk was responding to, to this request, which I, I thought was uh, really profound and very much in this, in this moment. If you had to go into a neighborhood, you'd have to think about all of these things at this moment. And, but I was reading the newspaper this morning, as I do every morning, and Nicholas Kristof had this headline, we're number 28 and dropping, which was a play on, we're number one, we just won, uh, that a, a study that looked at social progress and index of social well-being said that the United States was number 28, having fallen from 11 in the past 10 years which is very much in line with what I've seen and what I've worried about and what I've lectured about over that period of time. He pointed out that the index said we were number one in the quality of universities, but number 91 in access to quality basic education, number one in medical technology, but number 97 in access to quality healthcare, and number 100 in discrimination against minorities. And I, I think that's just a, a great window into uh, you know, if, if you're going to build anything, if you're going to think about anything, that we are number 28 and dropping. And, and that's really the, the fraying of our social fabric. How do we put ourselves back together so that we um, can do the things that you're supposed to do as a sound society? The, the headlines on the front page were equally chilling, ch uh, chilling. Trump admits he minimized the virus's threat. And the security chiefs admitted that they silenced concerns about white supremacy and the threat that that poses to the nation. So not only are we in trouble, but the, the leadership is not facing the problems. And so this is kind of the, the, in the old days, we used to talk about miasma of disease. In, in a way, this is the miasma. Um, that was discredited as a theory, but in a way we need to bring it back that there is a miasma and this is what it is. So what are the social foundations of health? This map is something that is shown in probably every class in public health and certainly every epidemiology class in medical school and perhaps urban planners and architects know it as well. The very famous map made by John Snow of cholera in London in the 1840s. And it has a series of lines um, that show where the cases were. And the cases were clustered around the Broad Street pump. The story, somewhat apocryphal, is that he took the handle off the Broad Street pump and ended the epidemic. Apparently that's not what happened. But the point is that the infectious agent was in the water. And this revealed that sanitation could change diseases. The issue when we know there's a problem is what are we going to do about it? And that's certainly where we are trapped right now in, in the US. What are we, we have problems, what are we gonna do about it? They were able actually, through urban reform movements at the beginning of the 20th century, to put in plumbing and clean up the sewers. So the environmental foundation of health is so important that disease rates fell before antibiotics or vaccines. So whooping cough, diphtheria, measles, scarlet fever, typhoid fever, and polio, all the rates went down. And th this is a fundamentally important that how we shape the environment is the foundation of health. So people, when they think health, we've all been trained in the biomedical model, they think disease and they think healthcare institutions. But to, but to say, no, 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 there's health, there's our ability to function, there's our ability to flourish, that's health. And that is a result of how we organize society. In my training as a psychiatrist, the fundamental representation of the complexity of the world in which the person was to be found was George Engel's biopsychosocial model. This is one of his diagrams of that model, really saying that there's a lot of systems out there that are, I don't know why it does that. There are a lot of systems out there that are bigger than the person and you can't understand the health of the person without thinking about those larger systems. I was in residency trained in family therapy, which got me started. 
But then when I started to study the AIDS epidemic in 1986, I realized that epidemics are really going out there into things as large as the biosphere, what we're watching now with this pandemic. When I started to study the environment, one of the first books I came across was American Building by James Marston Fitch. And this wonderful diagram of how the modern building takes the load of the natural environments off man's body and thus freezes energy for social productivity. But the converse is also true, that if we let the environment fall apart, those burdens are put back on us and then we have to deal with them. So this is what I've been studying for a long time. Addressing Professor Shabab's request in my own terms, he had asked me to talk about resilience, but um, I am very much of the school of thought that resilience really means you're so resilient is code for you're on your own, sorry. So it's a term I, I resist. I use the term social integration. In terms of thinking about a disaster falling on a community and how do you preserve the community, I think you have to understand what we've come to call fracture on fracture. In this moment of disasters, there's a convergence of disasters. And finally, if you wanna think about commercial corridors, I think you need to think about main streets. So to start with the first of those, Alexander Layton is the uh, father, in my view, the, the founder of the social psychiatry that, um, that I have really spent my career studying. And one of the things he said is that this social integration is what's the foundation for health, meaning the bonds of society, the ways in which we're connected to each other. If those are strong, the society is strong. If those are weak, the society is weak. And the strength of the social integration correlates with illness. So he, had, he thought of this on a continuum that at the far end, everything is falling apart. You'd have a collection and that would be characterized by the list you see. On the other end, you'd have integration characterized by this, the opposite list. And I'd just like to point out one, that in disintegration, the concern is for the self. You hear people say, I, I or, or at most, my family. Whereas when there's a commitment to the collective, you hear people say, we. And that's really the, the key here is that are people able to understand that their well being is linked to the well being of all? Thich Nhat Han actually thought this was so important. He invented the expression, we inter are, I N T E R dash A R E, a, a very important concept. This is from one of the three volumes of Alexander Layton's landmark three study of uh, Sterling County where he compared disintegrated communities to integrated communities. And this is a photo from their ethnography of what they thought a classroom looked like in an integrated community. I find this photo from the Hill District in Pittsburgh to be a parallel. This is what education looks like in an integrated community. This is the Hill District before urban renewal and deindustrialization wrecked the foundations of the community. So that's the ideal. Just to go back, uh, if I can convince my computer to do that. This is the ideal. This is what you want. You want calm and peace and learning. And, but what we have done to the American city is undermine neighborhoods with incessant policies coming from federal, state, and local governments. Now, in, in a way, to some extent, these policies, especially the most recent ones, are not overtly racial policies. But because of Jim Crow and the success we had in creating residential segregation, which has not been undone, a policy that falls on a neighborhood is inherently a racial policy. So racial segregation, redlining, urban renewal, highway construction, catastrophic disinvestment, deindustrialization, the destruction of housing projects in HOPE 6, gentrification, the subprime lending crisis. And now what's gonna happen with evictions around COVID uh, very well could be on, on the next catastrophic undermining of neighborhoods in our nation. We looked at this very carefully in the neighborhood of Harlem, which in the 1950s, by many measures using latent scale, fit was 
close to what a model community was, in spite of the problems of segregation, but it was attacked by all these policies, in a, which created not, not just one kind of downward turn of the spiral, but multiple ones. And all of these things like urban renewal disrupts the community for the sake of so-called progress, and, but doesn't put it back together. The progress is not meant to be for the community that's bulldozed, it's for other people. People at that point like to say, you have to break a few eggs to make an omelet, meaning I'm gonna break your eggs, to make an omelet, and I'm gonna eat really well tonight. So Harlem was hit by urban renewal, Harlem was hit by deindustrialization, Harlem was hit by drug epidemics that were not managed, and Harlem was hit by catastrophic disinvestment. And in this downward spiral, it moved from being a model community towards being a collection. This is a photograph by the famous African-American photographer, Charles Teeny Harris of urban renewal in Pittsburgh and uh, the destruction of the Hill District. And I think you can see this photo. You can certainly see a version of this photo in Beirut right now. Uh, all uh, you will be seeing versions of this photo from the West, from Washington State, Oregon and California. This, the emptiness and then the disconnection of the people. This, this is what the destruction of neighborhoods is about, the centrifugal, the forces that throw people apart from one another, that destroy social bonds and that undermine society. And so uh, this is a diagram that my colleague, Dr. Lourdes Rodriguez made as part of her dissertation on our work after 9-11. And I love this diagram of the segregated city. I love the idea that it's like these little pieces of, of broken glass. And the, the point is that the segregated city, it's not, it's not a whole, it's, in, it's literally in pieces. And so the problem is that when the trauma lands, when the disaster lands, it lands on the segregated city. And this is what we call fracture on fracture. So it's, it's like, you know, dropping a glass on the ground and it breaks. And then you take a hammer and you make the smaller pieces smaller. This is the, the people apart from each other and struggling. How are we gonna put this back together? My colleague, Leslie Rennes, thinks of this as, what if there's a dike and, and there's a huge number of holes? So we're all the little Dutch boy. What, what do we do in that moment? And and that is, a, I think, a really important image and, and thing to think about because in this moment, we have this convergence of catastrophes that is, uh, I, I think, gonna strain every, every resource that we have. So we know that global warming is um, coming from the destruction of the environment, the same source as COVID, the, the brutal exploitation of the world's resources by worldwide capitalism, and that uh, in this moment, we're watching things that we have never seen before, the wildfires in the West, and, and yet refusing to act. So we have that catastrophe. We also have the, the use of racism as a tool of political power and political control by the, by the Republican Party, and the endorsement of white supremacy as, as a correct way to act in the world, which has unleashed terrible violence and hatred. And then uh, the protests, thank God there are protests. And what people have talked about as good trouble using the term of uh, John Lewis, the great civil rights leader. And then we also have COVID and we are now at nearly 200,000 deaths, most of them unnecessary depending how you calculate the statistics. Um, so this moment is composed of these converging crises that seem to be in different domains of national life. So the, the racism and the response of Black Lives Matter, the climate change and COVID, but these all have the same source in how we live in the ecosystem. There's not, more than one ecosystem. There's one ecosystem of the world. 
And the social, the way we organize the social is part of that ecosystem. And so all of these are, what is our relationship? What's the social integration of the people with the biosphere? Well, studying AIDS in the early days in, in the 1980s, I became fascinated by the failure of epidemic response. And I thought, you know, when you have a normal epidemic response, which sometimes you do, what is it that happens? And we found that there were these stages where there was recognition and making alliances and mobilizing resources and breaking the chain of infection. And so the question is what, you know, why doesn't that always happen? What's going on? And I would just like to say that, that this failure to respond to crisis is really and truly psychiatrist territory. This is, um, you know, at the largest levels of scale, what psychiatrists should be thinking about when you talk about the mental health of the nation at any level of scale, you have to talk about the failure to act. The whole point of social integration is that the group comes together to solve problems. The whole point of social disintegration is that it can't. It is a fact that the climate has changed. It's a fact that climate change deniers are running our government. It's a fact that people can see and feel the truth. People can see the photos of the wildfires. They can feel when it's warmer than it's supposed to be. But it's also a fact that they can't acknowledge, they can't speak the truth. It's a fact that climate change poses danger to every aspect of our lives. And it's a fact that no leadership is showing us how to get to safety. This is quite extraordinary. And this is, this is in my opinion, the mental health crisis of our moment, that th this, that we are faced with a convergence of crises and we can't move because we are not together. So how do Main Streets fit into this story? Uh, I'd like to share some of my work on Main Streets. I've been looking at Main Streets since 2008. And just to start with, um, one of the things about Main Streets is you go to a Main Street and you see weird things. So this is in Arizona, just weird. And you see wonderful things. This is Niagara Falls, amazing and incredibly cold and slippery on this particular day when I was there with all that snow. And me bundled up, uh, I think with my purple hat and my red and purple scarf, I too was an amazing sight. Um, so going from amazing things, just like Niagara Falls or how Niagara Falls is organized, you know, what, what's its main street? doing uh, to, to sort of, is there some order here? Is there some structure that I ought to understand? It has been a, a great deal of what I've thought about over these 12 years. And one of the ways I thought about it was work I did with Jacob Eisenberg, who's a psychiatrist in San Francisco, um, looking at main streets in Essex County, New Jersey. We went to every sort of civic commercial center in, the, in this county and rated it on a scale of what we called hospitality, meaning how is the built environment put together? And we wanted to see if this, the, the, our rating of its hospitality correlated with our rating of its sociability. Were people there? And we found that it, uh, highly hospitable main streets had sociability. Um, but then the question was, well, where are they? And you'll see that the dark ovals are kind of in the middle of the county and in a complex pattern, this wasn't just about being wealthy or being poor. The wealthiest neighborhoods are to the West and they had actually been built after people decided not to build main streets, to build malls and they don't have main streets. So, and some of the great main streets are in very poor cities. So it was this combination of cities that were old enough to have been built when people built main streets and that had somehow escaped all these devastating policies of disinvestment. While we were doing the study, there were a number of disasters. And so one of the ways in which we got to reflect on, is, is this important? Is it important that things are different, that some places have resources, some places are wealthy, some places are poor, some places have main streets, some places don't. And so I'd like to share my reflections about two places that you would not think of at the same time, Essex County, New Jersey, and Southern Vermont. 
So Essex County, New Jersey, these are some photos. On the left, you see some of the wealthy places. On the right, you see some of the poorer places. And in the middle, I just want to point out one of the great treasures of Essex County, New Jersey, which is Bragman's Deli, the historic deli, fabulous pastrami. Um, and we're going to be doing a walking tour there later this year as part of our a, a Main Street reading group that the University of Orange is putting on. So if you're in Essex County and you want some fabulous pastrami, come with us. So this is kind of the, 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 the ways, of the, 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 what would you call it, the fracture of the, of the thing. It, it's wealthy and it's poor. Yet, when you look at this map, you see all these streets. And all the streets go everywhere. So the distribution of wealth is not along absolute boundaries. It's boundaries that are imposed by social custom. That's what segregation is. It's social custom. But there's this underlying structure of togetherness, which we came to call the tangle, that we think is is the resource, it's the hidden resource in all of this mess and why Main Streets are important in this moment of converging crises. Everything is falling apart, but those streets and those nodes are not falling apart. They exist, they are real, we can use them. Um, so I wanna talk about New Jersey Transit, which was lauded as one of the great railroads of the United States as late as 2007 but then was defunded in 2010 by Governor Chris Christie, who was a disaster for New Jersey. The, in, so when Sandy hit, New Jersey Transit made a terrible mistake and put their railroad cars basically in the wetlands. So one commentator said, if there is a predicted 13 foot or 10 foot storm surge, you don't leave your equipment in a low lying area. It's just basic railroading. You don't leave your equipment where it can be damaged. That's what they did. So they've had a rebuild since then, but after uh, you know, basically eight years of being defunded, it's taken a long time. This is the railroad that I ride to work when I used to go to work on a train. Something I remember from, was it years ago that we did that? Um, but you know, you could really get stuck in New York because they would cancel the trains. This is the, the whole, map of the railroad lines and I'm on the green line at Highland Avenue station. So this train set of train lines is overlapping on the road lines as another system of connection in Essex County. But Essex County, as you can see from the distribution of high and medium and low hospitality main streets is very fractured. So the county couldn't pull together to say we need our trains fixed. So this is very similar in a weird way to what I was seeing in Vermont. I go to Southern Vermont every year uh, uh, because when my dearest friend from medical school lives there and I love to hang out with her and she's really an ecologist and observer of the natural scene in her own right. She's a trustee of the Green Mountain Fund. Um, and she loved to show me what had happened, you know, what was going on. So we spent a lot of time looking at the damage from Tropical Storm Irene, which had washed out a lot of bridges and roads, caused a lot of havoc. It was a really concerted effort to rebuild and the whole state got behind it. So you might think, oh, they're all together and everything is fine. But I think when you look at the, the main streets and you think about this relationship, well, I said, you know, I just want to say that you wouldn't think the Ripton Country Store had anything to do with Bragman's Deli in Newark, New Jersey. But here's the point. The country stores in Vermont, everybody knows, are going out of business. And so some, this report said that some 30 had closed in the past decade and approximately 70 were still in business. The point is that these community hubs are incredibly important for this web, the sense that we are a web and we need to be in the web together. I was walking through the airport, um, you know, back when I used to fly places, I was walking through this airport and there was this ad for something. I don't remember what, I don't know what the ad was for it, but I love this image of the net 
of nerves in the human body. And this is how I think, this is the tangle. If you, I mean, it's the tangle in the human body, but the tangle is the same thing. It's a net of communication, of connection. And that is what we really have to uh, understand. So what are the implications? And, and let me just say one more thing about you know, Ripton here, that you, you don't think of these as linked. But the way in which they're connected is that the country stores are, are part, were part structurally of the Main Street web in Vermont, in Southern Vermont. And so a whole layer of the Main Street web has been lost. And that undermines pieces of the communication system that I don't think have been described, but that are, I, I, everybody is so horrified every time one of these stores closes that they're clearly very important. Same with the street that Bragman's Deli is on, Hawthorne Street, uh, very, very important that um, that street is lost. And if you look at this photo, you see that the snow has been shoveled in front of Bragman's and the store next to it. But then these other stores that have been abandoned, the, the snow is not shoveled. And this is not, all, this is not only local, this ripples I'm trying to assert through the whole county. I was going to um, uh, Raleigh-Durham to go to a conference and uh, to speak at a community group in Durham. And at that time, Kofi Boone, who's a wonderful landscape architect there, had just published a paper on the American Tobacco Trail. And he had done a study, does the trail unite or divide Durham? Lisa Sorg, who was a writer for this independent newspaper, did an article about it. She starts her, her story, hey, is that a boy or a girl? Oh, she's a small white woman. She said, I kept walking and mumbled to myself, if you have to ask, you don't need to know. Goddamn bitch, why didn't you answer? Now, this is obviously a black man, although she doesn't say that. She says, my name's not bitch. And the guy says, why are you getting all white on me? And then she goes on to say that uh, about the study. Uh, so I asked Kofi if he would be so kind as to put the American Tobacco Trail on the redlining map, which he did in seconds. Amazing thing about knowing designers, they can just do those things, which I can't do. But you see that the redlining map has the four dimensions of redlining. The green, which was the white places with new buildings and hopefully restrictive covenants, keeping people of undesirable racial elements out. The blue, which are slightly not quite as good, but pretty good. The yellow, which is where immigrants and factories and older buildings were. And then the red, which was basically where the least desirable racial elements lived. And the, certainly in the case of Haiti was the black community. These redlining maps have had many lingering effects and Kofi Boone talks about one of them. He said, he points out that there's a point on the trail where two ramps split off and to the east is St. Teresa, a low income community of color where the median household income is about 15,000 a year. To the west, Forest Hills is a largely white neighborhood characterized by homes in the upper six figures where household incomes top 70,000 annually. This is, this is the underlying fracture of the American city, American communities, which has been aggravated. This is redlining, this is segregation at the beginning. It's before we started to do urban renewal and build highways and, and clear cut neighborhoods and disperse people. So it's at the beginning when things were working. People had built communities. There were some connections between black and white communities. That fundamental fracture has been fractured and fractured and fractured and fractured. And COVID is the latest assault on top of that. Reverend William Barber, who I think is um, the greatest leader that we have at this moment, points out that white supremacy is the unconscious array of assumptions of inferiority and superiority that we carry in our heads, whatever their hue. But let us be clear, white supremacy is as poisonous to white people as it is to people of color. White supremacy is not just anti-black, it's anti-democratic, it's anti-humanity, -human it's anti-truth, it's anti-love. 
So th this is this is the fundamental thing that that we are are you know that really speaks to the mentality in the United States, the mentality that can't come back together to solve crises, is that we have these assumptions of inferiority and superiority. And it's, it's not just that white people think they're superior. Everybody thinks they're superior for some set of reasons. It's all nonsense. We're all the same. So this array of assumptions includes separateness, difference, and alienation from the other. What I want to say and argue most forcefully is that it blocks our ability to think ecologically. You can't think inferior and superior and think ecologically. You have to be able to think, as Thich Nhat Hanh taught us, we inter are. And so it creates a barrier to response to climate change and all the converging crises. So we are stuck. Uh, when I was writing this, I was having the image that we're stuck on the tracks and the train is coming. It's very scary. And you know what? Part of what's going on right now is that is that people are anxious. Rates of depression and anxiety are up. People are very afraid, uh, and, and actually, they're supposed to be. We are supposed to be nervous. We have converging crises, and we have leadership that's anti coming together. They're driving us apart at the moment when we need to be working together. So we are stuck on the tracks, and the train is coming. And this is this is profound. This is about mental health. And I think that, that really the issue here, the mental health issue, is that we need to transition from superiority consciousness to what I'm calling in this moment, one of consciousness, that, it, that it's a, a, a new consciousness that's needed. People write about the end of the feudal era and the emergence of capitalism, and they point out that Shakespeare becomes the voice of the emerging individual, and that it's in Hamlet when he says to be or not to be that you get the emergence of the individual. So perhaps Thich Nhat Hanh in saying we inter are is the voice of the new ecological consciousness pointing where we have to go. Now, I've told you a lot of terrible things and uh, you know, I just want you to watch this little girl in the white dress dance because the, the joy and the potential and the she just asserts herself and takes ownership of her dance. And I, I think that Um, so thank you for your attention. I'm going to turn it over to Elihu. Well, thank you so much, Mindy. Thank you for that talk. And uh, I'm applauding you, but I'm applauding on behalf of the hundreds of people who have tuned into this lecture, um, the many, many people who have registered for this lecture. I just want you to know, Mindy, that um, there may be people in our audience right now um, who have registered for this conference from all over the world. Um, there are people out there, of course, from, from New York, students and faculty from Hunter College, from NYIT, from Pratt, from Columbia. 
there are people in our audience now from uh, University of Michigan, from Harvard, from MIT, from UT Austin, from UC Berkeley. There are people from around the world, from Azerbaijan University of Architecture and Construction, from the Kharkiv National University of Civil Engineering and Architecture in Ukraine, from the University of Sao Paulo, from the University of Buenos Aires School of Architecture, Design and Urbanism, and many, many, many others. And so when I express my appreciation for your talk, I'm expressing it on behalf of everyone in the audience, really from all over the world who has come to, to join us. So, so thank you. Um, you know, I really have a relatively easy job here to, to moderate a conversation with you. And I want to invite our audience uh, to submit questions to the Q&A feature that we have here in this webinar. Um, and myself, but mostly Jackson, will be helping monitor that. And you can upvote certain questions that you see someone else has asked to sort of reaffirm that question. Um, and that may help uh, Jackson uh, prioritize. Um, but please do um, start submitting your questions as they, as they come to you. But I think I'll, uh, I'll start it off, Mindy. Uh, you know, it's such a, a pleasure to hear you speak and to speak with you now um, as someone who has admired your work for so long and, and keep urban alchemy and, and root shock uh, close by. Um, one of the things that you do in your work and in your lecture today is really generate a critique of top-down urban planning um, from, from the very start. And one of the things you do in your work and included in your talk today, even by closing with the um, story, if you will, of the, the dancing girl who asserts herself and makes her own movements and finds her own joy, is your emphasis on storytelling. Now, of course, in the history of urban planning, storytelling hasn't been emphasized very much. It has been maps and diagrams and photographs used to generate images of, of blight, for example. But I'm wondering if you could say something to our audience about the importance of storytelling. I mean, in your work, we're always right there with you, with your friends on the scene in Pittsburgh, navigating paths between the rivers, um, in Orange, New Jersey, of course, even in your work in France. Um, what can you tell this audience about the importance of of storytelling as a, as a method of doing this work, as a way of addressing some of the failures or um, some of the myopia, if you will, of more conventional urban planning and everything that it's done to, to generate the kind of fracturing that, that you've brought to our attention? It's a really great question. And you know, I'm a, I'm a psychiatrist, not an urban planner. Mm -hmm. That's really the beginning. And I, and I went into psychiatry as a specialty because the first day I was on psychiatry rotation as a third year medical student, there was a, a woman came in and I was to evaluate her. And she told me this story of growing up in Mississippi and it included, you know, tapeworms and this and that. And then she gave me some of her poems and I was blown away by what it was like to have this moment with this woman learning about her life. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wouldn't it be great to just spend your life hearing people's stories? Uh, but the other thing is that as I went into research and I started to do more formal kinds of things, survey research and other kinds of mapping projects, mm -hmm. I found that they didn't capture the story. That if I, I could do a great survey if I already understood the complex situation. But if I didn't know what was going on, I needed to go talk to people. And, and I found that that's really where my talents lay and my preferences lay in doing research. So I, I just really have tried to go into complicated situations and ask people to tell me their stories. Mm -hmm. It has been a great joy. And, and in your effort to um, sort of identify the need for social integration and to link social integration to the site of main streets, could, could you say a little bit more, more about that are you making that link partly through the stories of the people that you're meeting in these places, or are there other measures 
that we can look to to assess social integration? Should we be understanding it partly through narrative and story and anecdote and also by other techniques, um, other survey techniques or techniques of observation? How, how do you uh, sort of bridge that as you look to main streets uh, as a source of social integration or a place where we can measure or assess social integration? Well, well let's separate a couple things. Mm -hmm. You certainly can measure social integration. That's what the social index of progress is trying to do. Mm -hmm. but you can work from Alexander Layton's endpoints of disintegration versus integration. You know, what are, what are the strengths of the leaders? What's the situation of employment? How are the families working out? So you can take Layton's original definition and make that into measures, mm -hmm. which Emily Watkins did in her dissertation on the collapse of Harlem between 1950 and 1990. And the results are, are striking and irrefutable. So it's easy to, I, I don't think it's difficult to make measures of these things. My colleague Rod Wallace has made many measures of these things. Mm -hmm. So we can measure that easily. Now, the, the second part of the question is, I'm saying that main streets are centripetal places. They're constructed for that. So I'm not inventing that idea. The architects and the planners who built these main streets and who designed them had that idea. You know, they evolved that way in human culture. And then the architects said, how can we refine this? How can we make it even more powerful? So the idea that you could go from something like a market to a main street is human history, right? Mm. How do we make it strong? They were meant to be places that pull people together. Mm -hmm. So my observation is they, they do. And the thing about main streets that's interesting is that it's very quotidian. Mm -hmm. You go there to buy an ice cream cone and then you go home. It's not like going to the Metropolitan Opera on opening night. It's not that. It's the ordinary things of daily life that bring us to this place, this amalgam of the social, the commercial, the civic, and the public space. So love that. But it, we, it, it's not the opera, right? We can't be looking for glamour. It's, it's, it's the daily path of our lives that takes us there. So I think that um, main streets have the potential to serve our society we can, easily, we can easily strengthen them and get people to them. They're meant for that. Yeah. They just need our, our nurturance. Now in this moment, when small businesses are going into deep crisis because of the mismanagement of COVID, there's lots to do on Main Streets to make them strong. And you know, in the long term, how do we preserve small businesses, et cetera, but also in the short term, what can we do as pop-ups? How do we use that space today and tomorrow so that people can walk through the space and feel joy and feel a little bit of relaxation and see other people and cross paths and feel normal. Mm -hmm. so main streets are incredibly important in this moment of crisis. What we decide to do with our main streets will be part of deciding how we emerge from this. Does that make sense? It does, it does, thank you. Um, you know, we're getting a lot of really great questions coming in with many uh, sort of um, upvoting of them. And I'd like to turn to our audience to, to, um, to get some of these questions. Now, if it were possible, we could, um, we could ask them to speak for them themselves. Um, for example, um, there, there are a number of these I'd like to ask, but one question that jumps out to me right here is by Bob. Can, can we let Bob ask his own question here? Um, or I can ask it for him if that's just easier, Jackson. Yeah, absolutely. I'll um, get him uh, opened up to talk here. Great. Hi, Bob. Hi, thank you for, hi, thank you for the lecture. It's been uh, very enlightening. I've really enjoyed it. I'm an architect, and uh, I see uh, I was influenced by James Marston Fitch as well uh, uh, early in my career. Uh, I'm wondering, you know, what are the psychological treatment for climate change, racism, fracturing of the cities? What is the, what is the interlock between our built environment and that uh, psychological uh, a domain that lives within us? Well, if we can talk about this on two time scales. So in my book, Urban Alchemy, which Elihu pointed out before, I uh, visited with architects and urban planners in the U.S. and abroad 
and discerned what I thought of as nine elements of urban restoration that they were using. So I think that those elements of urban restoration are fundamental to the long-term repair of the ways in which we've destroyed our, our environment. Mm. And one of them, for example, is that we have to keep the city in mind. So segregation keeps us locked in our neighborhoods and we don't think at the scale of the city. So we have to think at the scale of the city to do the repair. But we're in um, a, a crisis, a, a deep crisis at this moment. So thinking more short term, not about the built environment, but in the social environment, I, uh, what our team found after 9-11 in looking at the recovery of New York City was that organizations in the short term had the crucial role to play. Organizations could take up what we call collective recovery. One example that I think is one of the most powerful ones, the government was really dragging its feet about shutdown and the NBA canceled its season. And basically everybody took the hint and said, oh, we're supposed to be shutting down and they did. So that's an example of an organization recognizing a problem and, and being helpful to the, to, the, to the populace. And every organization of any kind, a bank, a supermarket, a Boy Scout troop, any organization can say, what is it, I, what is it that's in our mission that we can do to help America feel better and to get through this crisis? And so that's where I think the action is right now, more short term. Yeah, thank you. And, uh, you know, I think of sort of a follow up to that um, and representing um, sort of the interests of so much of our audience, which I forgot to mention includes many of our current students and many, many of our um, alumni and, and graduates of uh, the Yale School of Architecture and many others is, is coming from L Lewis Conway, who I think is also uh, expressing a question from architects. Lewis, are, are you out there to, to ask, uh, ask Mindy your question? Here he comes. Yeah, hi, it's uh, Louis Conway here. Um, yeah, I'm interested in the role architects can play, not only in um, how architects contribute to the built environment, but how architects can advocate for um, integration within communities. What's the political role of the architect, not just the design role of the architect? Great question. So, um, you may know that I served as a public director on the board of the American Institute of Architects and a, um, an uh, honorary member of AIA. So I got to hang out with a lot of wonderful architects during that period and, and since. So, so I've actually, and they asked me that question, so I actually got to answer it. But the thing I'd like to say to you in this moment is that the political response is two parts. First of all, you know, with the wildfires and with the, uh, uprisings against police violence and with COVID devastating neighborhoods, many communities are in terrible trouble and just terrible trouble that they haven't seen before. I think that the AIA's RUDAT program, which I think has the worst name, but is one of the great programs, mm -hmm. is actually something that should be scaled up and you, you should just be sending those RUDAT teams everywhere. You know, this is like, take a, every, ask every architect to take a couple weeks and go someplace that's in trouble and give some advice. Both thinking very short-term, pop-up strategies. You know, what can you build in a week that'll make people feel better? I, I saw a video of a Rudat in a community that had been hit by a tornado and they made a park in a week. And it was just, you know, we need that. But secondly, all of us are in organizations and so the question is to go to every organization that you're part of, your bank, your supermarket, your AIA chapter, and say, what is it that we should be doing in this moment to help? Now, I just wanna say that broadly, as we've been conceptualizing this, we think that the, the great harm that's driving us apart, the centrifugal force, is Trump's insistence on racial hatred and fear. And that the centripetal force is about love. And we think of this as turn on the love. So my assignment to you is go back to every organization you're part of and say, how do we turn on the love? Absolutely, very, uh, very good advice for architects and for all of us. Uh, I really wanna to get to all of these questions, but I'm hoping we can turn to Trudy Watt right now, um, who has a really nice question here that kind of returns us to your observations of main streets. Uh, Trudy. 
Are you out there? Yes, I am. Hello. Okay. Thank you, Professor Fullalove. This has been such a wonderful talk. Um, I'm, I'm very curious about um, if you might be able to say more about how you observe hospitality on main streets. And I ask that because to me, it seems like there would be a tension between maybe observing hospitality as sociability as you outlined it and the uh, pressure to operate um, from a perspective of customer service in a touristic sense, which just feels like there might be something at odds between sort of profit and the, the notion of hospitality that you put forward? Well, it's a good question, we, but we like to think about hospitality in that deeper sense. So the hospitality of like hotels and hospitalities of hospitals come from the same group. So how do you, how do you care for people and make them feel comfortable? And we use the term and defined it as a feature of the built environment. So it's not a feature of what people do. So it had to do with the integrity of the built environment, like were all the buildings there. So for example, sometimes, typically an American Main Street, uh, and, and this happens on Main Streets in other countries as well, there are punctuation points at the end of the section that's the Civic Commercial Center. And often those punctuation points are gas stations, for example. So mm -hmm. something that has a different relationship to the street. Now, when you go in the middle of the Civic Commercial Center and you put a drive-in for Wendy's, you have disrupted the this built environment what what we were calling hospitality so we're talking about things like that and this is fully described in our uh jake and i have done two papers on our model of main street so it's fully described in the first paper hospitality invites sociability and hmm. uh, i think i've reconstructed much of the argument in my main street book but the paper is easy to find in the second paper we add on to that the, the tangle this concept of the tangle so hmm. there you have it yeah, thank you. Um, you know, there's a couple questions here that are sort of Essex County specific. Uh, maybe some New Jerseyites or others interested in your observations of, of Essex County, the main streets there, and also the, the, um, the New Jersey transit story. Maybe, maybe Richard um, Bed, Bed, Bednarzik and, um, and also Barbara Spitz, M maybe each of you could ask your question and Mindy can respond to both of them because I think they're both, um, um, they sort of uh, are connected to each other. Uh, Richard, do you want to go first and then Barbara, you can, you can jump in after that? Sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I know, sir, I'm a lifelong New Jersey resident. I live in Bloomfield right now in Essex County and I commute or post before COVID commuted to New York City every day and I started to notice uh, looking along the train lines that those were typically the more affluent, wealthier towns. And as, as service became uh, worse and worse along the train lines, I thought this was almost counterproductive because it seemed the wealth that um, was in those towns uh, was directly related to access to Manhattan and the corporate jobs within Manhattan. Um, so it was almost the only reason why that New Jersey had high real estate was because of that access, direct access to Manhattan. Um, but did, did you ever see that, that so ruining the train system seemed to actually be counterproductive to the state, but also do you, did you happen to ever see the street life of Manhattan coming back to any of those towns and the social engagement that occurs uh, within the streets of New York um, reflected within the workforce that commuted. Mm. Yeah. Well, Mindy, do you want to address that right, right away? Yeah, please. Yeah. Um, well, the, the point that we're trying to make about Essex County is that it, it's, is that we think exactly what you think. I mean, I thought it too until we really were, were like really studying the tangle that the train lines go to the wealthy towns. But the train lines also go to the poor town. So the train stops in Newark, or my train, for example, Morris and Essex, but also all the Montclair, probably your train stops at uh, in, Newark. In also. Bloomfield. Yeah. Newark also had the race riots, which the National Guard uh, yeah. was called in, which is reminiscent now of so, uh, what's happening on the West Coast. The train goes through Newark. There's two stops in East Orange. There's two stops in Orange. 
So there, there are significant stops in these uh, in places that are much poorer. And so the train has importance in places that are poor and importance in places that are wealthy, mm -hmm. but they're not, they don't intrinsically see themselves as needing to get together around the train. That's the point we're trying to make. Uh, right. So yeah, maybe we could go on to Bridget's. Yeah, ba Barbara, why don't you uh, jump in please? Sure, thanks very much. Um, so full disclosure, I did grow up in Bloomfield. Um, <laughs> but I had always thought, and I am an architect, I, I had always thought that a lot of the kind of richer neighborhoods were due to literally topography, that they were on the hills, that they had better views of Manhattan, that they, granted they did have the train system, but it always seemed to be more of a regional point that the Western kind of areas on the hills were the richer areas, whereas Bloomfield and Newark and Nutley were kind of in the valley and frankly less, more blue collar and, and poorer. And I wondered if that, what your thoughts were on that kind of three-dimensional topography as opposed to some of the other things that you may have mentioned. Thanks very much. Yeah. Um, you know, the, uh, in, in Orange, Orange Main Street comes out from Newark. It's Orange Road in Newark by the Passaic River comes out now quite disrupted, but I, I talk about this Orange um, as a, just a very important connector. When it gets to the bottom of this first mountain in West Orange, the road splits and it goes north and it goes south. And so it goes north to Montclair and it goes south to South Orange Maplewood, uh, the lower parts. So, and why is that? What people have explained to me is that in the old days, horses and carriages couldn't make it up the hill. The hill is very steep. So they, they had to find like these more sideways and they didn't develop that. So when you look at the redlining map from the 1930s, the redlining map of Essex County, that area is not developed. So it doesn't get developed until the post-World War II suburbanization. So there's certainly a piece of topography that's very important in, in the urbanization, but that, that urbanization became the wealthy. I, I don't know that that's a foregone conclusion. Um, for example, Pittsburgh's Hill District, topography of the hill, but the black people and immigrants live there, not the wealthy. So who lives on the hill, I think, is, a, is, is part of the history of the place and how developed over time. I hope we have time for more questions. I'm not going way over here. Uh, am I, uh, organizers? Uh, Mindy, can you uh, answer a few more? I, I'd really like to go to Bridget, actually, as long as we're speaking about the New York metro area, and she has many uh, thumbs up here as well. Um, Bridget, um, can we, there you are. Uh, hi, Bridget, can, can you ask your question? Hi, sure, can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Um, I was, I don't want to assume I know what you meant when you said that Harlem went from a model community to a collection. So I'm just wondering if you could elaborate how you're using those terms. Um, yeah, if, if you can remember back to the earlier part of my lecture when I was talking about the model and the collection and how Alexander Layton defined those, we use those to develop our measurements. That was related to what Elihu was asking before. How do you measure those things? Mm -hmm. So for example, in 1950, 72% of the families in Harlem were headed by two parents, but by 1990, um, only 14% of the families were headed by two, by two parents. Similarly, employment that was very high had dropped. So on every measure of the ways in which things are put together, they had been pulled apart. So that's how we did it. Thank you. And Stephanie, uh, Stephanie Lovely, um, you have, I think, a very interesting question here um, that would be nice to ask. Uh, hi, Stephanie. Hi. Um, thank you again for organizing this and for your talk. Um, I'm just interested in how you see the physical space, the physical collective space, being able to cultivate this um, sort of ideology of that inter R you were talking about in communities. How can um, design help to foster that sense of 
that community or systemic changes that could lead to that in the community. So um, my book, Urban Alchemy, is these is visits to urbanists in the United States and abroad. The urbanist that I studied with the most was Michel Cantal Dupar. As a psychiatrist, you can imagine I didn't learn much about cities in my training. I didn't learn anything. So when I got interested in the, um, you know, sort of what was the environment doing, I, I happened to be at a conference in 1993 in, in Paris called and Cantal, Michel Cantal Dupar was giving the opening lecture. And he said that doctors understood that if there was a boil on the skin, you had to understand what was going on in the whole body. And the same was true of a city, that if a neighborhood had a problem, you had to be able to think about the whole city. So as a doctor, I was like, oh, I do know that. So I, I asked him if he would teach me about cities, which he graciously agreed to do. And so I've been going to France regularly since basically 1996 to study with him. And so much of what I've learned about this, I've learned from his projects and I described quite a number of them in uh, Urban Alchemy. Mm -hmm. And his thesis is that, uh, you know, you can see the fracture in the built environment. And the job of the designer is, is to do that seeing and to fix it. So the, the spatial reading of division is not so easy for those of us who don't have the spatial training of designers. But designers don't necessarily look for fracture. Mm. So, and then designers, I mean, look, we're in capitalism. Who pays architects the most is big capitalists and make, make you design big skyscrapers and other kinds of things mm -hmm. that don't heal the city. So, but the issue is that, that you, you do know how to heal the city if you look for that. So I think the trick is for you to look for it and then use your skills. How would you put those things together? It's thinking of what are all the millions of ways you can build a bridge between say two communities that are separated by a highway or all the other kinds of tricks that urban planners have used to create fracture in the built environment. Um, think about segregation in neighborhoods by covenants or segregation by the, by zoning that means you can only have one price of housing all of these things designers can see and fix so that's um not necessarily something i can see but i know that's what you should look for right and uh we we do have time i've gotten my cues here from uh jackson i do know that a number of our current students and probably a number of our, of our alumni uh, are also looking to carry on the uh, post lecture tradition of having a cocktail. So um, I'm going to officially authorize our current students to uh, make their cocktail now if they would like to. Um, so that's, that's okay. You can go forward with that uh, for our last uh, 50 minutes. Uh, Mindy, unfortunately, we can't do that uh, ritual in this uh, format, but I think a number of our students have decided to, to carry forward with that, with that spirit. Um, but let's go down the list here. Um, Ken Harris uh, has, a, has a really interesting question that I'd love to hear your response to. Uh, Ken, uh, are you out there? Yes, I'm sorry. I was looking for the mute button there. How no, we got you. How you doing? Good, how are you, Ken? Good I'm doing fine. Um, thank you so much uh, for tonight. And I know, and we've talked a lot about, uh, and I always talk about kind of rebuilding and building uh, but I was just curious what your thoughts around what structures do you think need to be dismantled or demolished in order to make room, mm -hmm. you know, because I think of like the prison system, because I know that in this country, they got the advice of psychologists and psychiatrists with regards to building supermax prisons. And then they were kind of encouraged not to do that because it's not going to be good for the mental health of the inmates, but we built them anyway. So I wonder, are there any structures in our communities uh, around that actually need to be dismantled and demolished in order to make room for these new structures in the rebuilding of community? And I was on a, a team um, in France uh, the president of France had asked for teams of architects and other people from other disciplines to work together to sort of envision the future of the greater Paris region. And the team that I was on looked at, um, you know, we were all working together and 
actually is very influential on my Main Street study because my job, which Cantal gave me, was to go around the greater Paris region and take photographs of all the different things. So in the final report of the project, one of the authors talked about the Tour Montparnasse. So Tour Montparnasse is, you know, in the southern part of Paris, that tall building, it was, oh, what a horror, it ruins the whole Paris. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, he was just riffing on, but maybe it's because it's like a giant building, but it's the only one. And what if you did things to make it fit better? Um, and I think that that's really the question, you know, because in, in America, if there's something wrong, um, you want to knock something down. But actually, in American urban planning or American urban problems, whatever the question is, the answer is move the Black people. So if you think about all the Black people that are in prison, if you go knock down the prisons, you're going to move the Black people, which, you know, it's just like, don't move anybody. Don't displace them, even from prisons. Like, so the, the issue is we have a prison, we built it badly. How do we make it a great place? Things, everything can be redesigned. And if we're gonna have fewer prisons, which is really the goal, then how do we make those ex-prisons useful to people? So rather than knock things down, it's what can we do with them? And then in, I am co-author with Hannah Cooper of a book called From Enforcers to Guardians, uh, a public health primer on ending police violence. And one of the things that I loved was the proposals of Studio Gang around what to do with police stations. And I said, you know, why not think of the police station as a center of conviviality in the neighborhood and how to do that in the short term, medium term and long term. Very wonderful thinking. So I think that's that's the point is not to knock anything down, but to figure out how do we make it useful in the new way we want to live together. Does that make sense? I know you're on mute. You probably can't find the button. I'm just going to think that you think it's OK. Ken? Okay. Okay, good. Um, yeah, let's go to um, Kelechi. I, I may not be saying that right, but um, Kelechi, could you uh, come on and ask, uh, ask your question? Yeah, sure. Uh, and thank you so much for this amazing presentation. It's been so insightful. I, I think my question has been, because you brought up um, white supremacy earlier, and I I, I've been working with a, some programs that have been federally funded and now we were going to have conversations about race, but now it's actually been banned. So it's been officially banned. Any federally funded program cannot talk about racism, cannot talk about white supremacy. Um, there's no more race trainings allowed. And I just was wondering what your thoughts are on that or how can we keep having these conversations when they're officially banned? Well, I mean, I mean, I'm a psychiatrist. So how do you have a country that's torn apart by race and you, you make a, an announcement you can't talk about it? During the AIDS epidemic, you know, there were many people were getting infected because they shared needles. And it was against the law to talk about, to, to do a study, not even to do needles, but to do a study of needle exchange. Um, then the gun lobbies have made it nearly impossible for the Centers for Disease Control to study gun violence. So one of the tools of using racism for political power is to prohibit discussion. So we need to understand how fundamentally destructive to democracy prohibiting discussion is. And then we also need to say, is there any reason that we can't continue the conversation. There's, okay, you can't have the conversation over there, but what are all these people doing in the streets? They're having the conversation. We're having the conversation. So I think we have to uh, not presume that they have the power to shut the conversation down. They have the power to enact using racism for political power. We have the power to continue to challenge that. And, and that's what we have to do. Just as people did illegal needle exchange and did illegal studies with funding from foundations to show that needle exchange helped in the stopping the transmission of AIDS. So we have to keep going and we have to find the way. Kalechi, did you want to follow, follow up on that? Okay, well, uh, thank you. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Oh, no, I just wanted to say thank you. Um, I, we, 
I couldn't unmute myself and so you allowed me to unmute myself. <laughs> um, the, we're planning on removing language and still having discussions and calling them discussions instead of training. So um, mm -hmm. we're gonna keep going on even if our funding is pulled, but I um, mm -hmm. appreciate you saying that too. Thank you. Uh, let, let's go to Mira Choi. I think she has a really interesting question that, that's raising the issue of, of intersectionality, which is something that um, many of us are thinking about these days as well. Uh, hi, Mira. Hi, um, thank you so much for this wonderful talk. Um, I'm a sociology PhD student, and I've been interested in um, understanding how spatial boundaries are um, set against certain gender, sexuality, and even age. So um, I was wondering um, how you understand, like not only race, but also other um, gender or age, age factors that are um, contributing to shaping the place and its um, implications for mental health? And do you believe that is, um, there is a fundamental um, perspective, philosophy, or solution that can heal these multiple axes of fractures that is going on in the place? Yeah, thank you. We did a project over the last four years called uh, 400 Years of Inequality, and it was a project to call for observances of last year, 2019, as the 400th anniversary of, of Africans arriving at Jamestown to be sold into bondage. And we called our project 400 Years of Inequality because we, we were impressed that in order to justify slavery, the slavocracy in, in really amplified an existing concept of inequality. But once it becomes codified in, in law and custom, it's then like a, it's like a, you know, a thing, it's a concept. And it gets used against everybody. So all of us are in inferior superior relationships and are injured by that, whether we're on superior position or the inferior position. And the ways in which this is enacted against groups is very varied. And, and so you have to follow the threads, but the point is that the threads are all interwoven and they all start, there's, there's a moment, not that everything starts then, but there's a moment in 1619 when the Africans are brought over to work land that has been stolen from the Powhatan nation on which the English are gonna establish plantations and to use that science fiction concept of terraforming, they're really terraforming the forest that has been managed by the Powhatans in a certain kind of way in, to make England. They're terraforming England in the space of North America. Hmm. And that sets everything in motion. So I think it's, it's that. To see, I think it's very important to see that the injury of this inferiority, superiority thinking is to all of us and to figure out how every single person is fundamentally injured by this. Mm -hmm. I, I think um, it's important to understand when we are allies and, and when it's our own struggle, but it's also very important always to know how each of us, I need to know how I was hurt and you need to know how you've been hurt by this inferiority, superiority thinking so that we can each wholly own that we need to th overthrow this and begin to have ecological consciousness. Yeah, thank you. Um, we have just a few more minutes, but I'd like to get to the questions here uh, by from uh, Leanne Pfeiffer. And it also uh, relates actually to a, a recent question from um, Celia uh, Poirier. Um, Leanne, can you come on and uh, to ask your, your question? Hello? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Uh, the first part's a bit long. Thank you so much presentation. Um, I'm going to skip to my question in the sake of the time. What, what are your thoughts on the cross cultivation of multidisciplinary approach to the onset of a project through to the built realization um, coming from an architectural and sustainable background where we're trying to do carbon offsetting and deal with, you know, other aspects, but with your expertise and on a social and cultural Oh, this is what we need in, in our building process, but we need to convince our clients and the community that these is something that's critical in healing the environment and helping our projects. And can you let me know how we can start to include and make this 
dominant discussions in the architectural community? I mean, you already know that it's important and that it makes a big difference. And I, I think at that point, you know, sometimes you just do things because they're right and you don't get paid for them. The difference is what Karl Marx called exchange value and use value. Mm -hmm. and Frederick Douglass, the great liberator, said most famously, you may not get every, you may not get paid for everything you do, but you can surely you may not, I'm, I'm really messing up this quote, which I say all the time. Uh, you may not, you know, so the idea is you're going to do a lot of work. Some of it you'll get paid for and some of it you won't, but you're going to have to do the work. So if you think it's the right work, you have to do it. Many times in our research group, we just had to do work because it was the right work and we didn't have any funding for it. So I, I think that's where the rubber hits the road and you get to make your own practice be the best that it can be. You can't make it all about money. Mm. Oh, yeah. here's the quote. You may not get everything you paid for, but you will surely pay for everything you get. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You may not get everything you pay for. So. Right, right. That's a hard pill to swallow, but once you swallow it, then you get relaxed and you're like, okay, I'm on my own time, but this is the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, where I worked at New York State Psychiatric Institute, they said that going to France was against policy. A lot of people did international travel, but my going to France was, was not okay. So therefore I had to take vacation time every time I went to study with Cantel. Mm. That was not a vacation. One time we went to 43 cities in 56 days. That was not a vacation. And then I had to come back and go back to work. So, uh, and I, you know, or, or I had to take leave and not get paid at all. But I couldn't, understand the things I was trying to understand unless I made that sacrifice. So there you have it. Yeah. Uh, this has been so interesting. I want to thank everyone for asking all these questions. I do want to do one last question because I think it's very appropriate to our current format. It comes from Tamara Roy. And this will be our last question. Um, unfortunately, we can't get to absolutely everyone. But Tamara, if you're out there, could, could you ask your, your question? And then I'll just very briefly um, wrap up and close for, for the evening. Hi, hi, Tamara. Hi, thank you so much for, for picking my question. Um, well, I wanted to say two things. One is I loved your image of the fractured glass and repairing it, the little arrows of the repairing, and it made me think of soldering a stained glass window together because it's optimistic, right? And we're trying to put together something that's beautiful. Mm. Um, and I think you, most of your work was tonight, at least that you were talking about, was f focusing on how physical places do that or are starting to not do that anymore. And I think it leads to this question about digital space and the internet and how can we use the internet as a positive platform to try to form communities um, and heal some of those that fracturing um, and a, a subtext was really that um, there's so much fracturing on the internet and it can be very negative. People bring a lot of their negativity to it. And so how do we bring your optimism to it? And it's kind of a question for everyone. Like I, I walk away from this thinking, what can I do to enter a digital space and bring my own positivity and desire? And your, what you said, turn on the love. <laughs> So that's my question. That was a great question. A, a friend of mine um, sent me a thing uh, about Japanese. There's a Japanese um, craft of soldering broken pottery with gold. Uh, it's mm. exquisite, and I don't remember the name of it, but it's a, it's a like stained glass. Um, mm. The yeah, I think you got right to the answer, which is that it, you, each of us needs to turn on the love and in every space we go into. I, my book came out uh, on Tuesday, was the official launch of my Main Street book. And um, I was going to have my party at this fabulous restaurant in New York City called Coogan's. I've been dreaming about this for years. But Coogan's was hit hard by the pandemic and went out of business but also nobody could go inside a restaurant. So I, I couldn't have my party at Coogan's and, and I was pretty devastated. So I was like depressed and pouting, but the University of Orange team said, well, we'll give you a party. And then 
out of kind of the, the talking to friends and, and, you know, all the people we work with and all the people that were part of putting together the Main Street book came a party that was fantastic. And I don't really know why it was so fantastic. I mean, but somehow music showed up and Andy Merrifield, who wrote the forward to the book, was saying that it reminded him of Thelonious Monk, Easy Street. And then my dean started playing Easy Street and it just went on like that. And it was so magical. And who would have thought a Zoom party could be so magical? But I think everybody brought their love. So that's my final say. We've all got to turn on the love because Trump and his colleagues are sure pumping out the hate. Mm. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Thank Mindy, you. for that um, really inspiring close to a, a fabulous kickoff to this um, symposium. Uh, really, uh, we are all going to be turning on the love, and um, it's been very inspiring. And we really can't thank you enough for being a part of this. Um, I just want to say before we, um, before we um, um, sign off for the evening that we are just at the beginning of a really absolutely incredible and, and inspiring lineup um, that, that our organizers, that's Kate and Mariana and Gus and Jen and Jackson and Araceli, our, um, our organizers have have been working so hard to put together with the support of, of the school and, and our dean. And I just want to make sure people have in their calendar the next event, which is next Tuesday, September 15th at 1 p.m. That's Tuesday, September 15th at 1 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. It's the hospital panel, and that's going to be with, with Kalechi uh, Uboza, who we heard this evening, a writer and mental health advocate, uh, Christian Carlson, an architect, uh, Jason Danziger, also an architect, and will be moderated by Matthew Steinfeld. And so we really uh, look forward to that. It's nice to have things sort of um, stretched out here, something for us to look forward to. And I hope all of you will return and come back so we can keep building this community uh, and hopefully live out some of the potential of, of having productive conversations that, that I think Mindy has, has really introduced for us tonight. Um, so with that, uh, on behalf of the School of Architecture and the organizers, thank you so much for being here. Mindy, thank you again. Um, it's, it's really been, uh, been an, uh, an honor and a great experience to, to hear this. So uh, I'm going to turn this back over to the, the organizers to the official sign off, but thank you all so much for joining us. Um, and good night, Mindy. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks, thanks to everyone out there. Uh, we'll, we'll see you next week.